go ahead and fire this little thing up here. Um, last week, obviously, I did a sermon on what I called the wiles of the devil or the devices. You know, we, we don't want to be ignorant of Satan's devices. We need to know how our enemy works so that we might have uh, a little bit more of a hope in defeating our enemy and winning spiritual battles. And so what I've been doing is looking throughout the scriptures, compiling a little study here to help us to see how we can live a Christian life in a successful way. And one of the things uh, I'll talk about a little bit this evening, believe it or not, is going to be some false teaching in regards to salvation and Christian's life. And one thing, that, you know, you might have noticed here even from, from Jack Sunday School, he talked about Hezekiah and these different people. Some people are saved, some people are unsaved. And you notice some of these people like Solomon, he falls into idolatry at the end of his life. And David fell into heinous sin, as we'll go through some of that in the sermon here this morning, Lord willing. And what you'll notice is men and women of God all throughout the Bible, they have, they have fought the devil and sometimes they lose. Now, obviously, like I said before, the main battle has been won. Uh, sin and death has been defeated by Jesus on the cross. You know, if you're saved, if you trust the Christ as your savior, you're sealed until the day of redemption. You can't lose your salvation. And we're not talking about eternal salvation in the battle being lost. We're talking about temporal fights, physical battles on in this life. And uh, the best way I've heard it described is, you know, in World War II, we dropped the bombs on Japan. And they were like, all right, we're done. They tapped out. You know, that, that ended that. But they say that the battles raged on on those little islands, you know, for, for a good period after that. The word didn't get out. You know, they, they didn't get word of that. And so that's kind of how it goes right now. Satan's been defeated. But, and, and then we're already waiting still yet for the day when Christ comes back, sets up his kingdom. We experience the rapture, uh, new bodies. You know, there's all these things we're waiting for. The battle's won, the war's won, and there's little battles here still yet to fight. And so Satan ain't going to go down without a fight. Uh, one thing you got to realize as you seek to see people saved or live for the Lord is the devil is going to kick back against you. And so one of the things I want to help everybody in here realize is that as you, as you live your life, whether or not you want to be engaged in this war, you are. And I've, I've learned that in, in, in my Christian walk and in my life in general is Satan wants to destroy you. And that's why I had a couple of of, uh, you know, just key text, I guess you could say, when you talk about spiritual warfare, when you talk about battling the devil, there's a few scriptures that immediately pop into any, anybody who knows the Bible's mind. One of them, of course, that we went through last week, Ephesians 6, verses 11, 12, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, that's the schemes of the devil, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's not just about, you know, Obama or or, you know, whatever evil leader there is, you have to realize the book of Daniel teaches us, the Bible teaches us, there are demons behind these people. You better believe there's a demon behind Hillary Clinton. I mean, goodness sakes. You better believe there are demons behind Kim Jong-un and all these other weird leaders around the world. There's demons. There's a spiritual battle going on where they're pushing them a certain way. And we see that even in Revelation in the end times that uh, evil spirits like frogs go out and they bring and pull people in, as Ezekiel says, by the hooks of their jaw to battle. They, they're going to bring in the nations to do what God wants to do, to bring them to battle so he can destroy them. And even now there's evil spirits that are leading these places. So it's not flesh and blood. And so we've got to be careful not to take out all your anger and frustration just on a person. You've got to understand that there's demons behind these people sometimes. Even people you may be talking to, whether it's a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon missionary. You've got to understand this is a spiritual battle. These people are in bondage to the devil. It goes on and says, but you battle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Uh, another good place to turn to here is in 1 Peter. And like I said, you can really, you can go all over the Bible and find different things. First Peter chapter five, verse eight says this, you need to be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Uh, that's a good base text. And then another one here, second Corinthians two eleven. 
lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. And so these kind of stand as the base text for this study, this little series I've, I'm putting together here. And now if you would, like I said, be over in 1 John 2. That's where we're going to look at now. Last time we looked at some of the ways that Satan attacks, and we've seen that he wants to make you doubt the Word of God. Uh, it's kind of like disarming a, a believer to take away your Bible, to take away your faith in the Bible is to disarm you. He wants to distort the word of God. Let's say, well, I believe the Bible is the word of God. I believe that this book is divinely inspired, inerrant. And we're talking about the King James on any perverted little translation. But this Bible is the word of God. I believe that. Well, then what he'll seek to do with you is he'll seek to either twist or distort that Bible. He'll say, well, does that word really mean that? Or he'll say, is that really the way it should be phrased? Or can you not water this doctrine down a little bit and, and see some unity over some, some falsehood? Or he'll try to twist it. Those are the ways that Satan comes at it. And all of it is really to disarm you. And you, you say, well, is there a physical example of this in the world? There is. Now, spiritually, Satan wants to uh, twist the word of God and disarm you by doing so. Make you doubt the word of God and disarm you by that. Well, what do these wicked governments try to do with their citizens? They want to disarm you from your guns, from your weapons. And that's Satan's tactics are the same both physically and spiritually. It's kind of interesting if you think of it that way. But in order to, you know, uh, dominate a people, you have to take away their weapons that the people would defend themselves. And so rest assured, uh, before this end times government takes place, you're going to see a ramping up of people's guns being taken. And we've already seen this. I heard in Alaska, they told them, you know, take, put, you got to put in your guns. It's a, it's voluntary, you know, quote, voluntary. And you get some money for it or something. But if you don't do it, then they'll come take it. Um, and I've seen even in the United States sometimes, whether it's a, if it's a crisis in a flood zone, you know, they'll be kicking in your doors and taking, taking you out of there and, and forcibly removing you. It's a very scary thing. And I, I posted this on the internet last night. If you was to just off the cuff talk about all the wicked things happening in our world right now it'd be very debilitating uh, the other day i seen forced vaccination they said uh oh measles, measles broke out by the way ain't nobody died from it by, by the way it, you know it's only in a couple places and by the way we used to get chicken pox when we was little we all live we're all here you know sometimes they'd have chicken pox parties and people would go and get it on purpose you know from what i understand and so now they're, oh, measles broke out. And the, the here's where they go. It's always, it's the same thing every time. It's hilarious. It's like, so they use some little thing to jump off onto some other thing, right? It's like, oh, we can use that to do what we really want to do. And I wouldn't be surprised if the government did it themselves, to be honest with you, if they just purposely gave measles to people so that they could do this. But as soon as that broke out, you got like 700 cases of it or something. And most of them was in New York. The first thing the Democrats and those wicked people started trying to say is, well, we need to get rid of religious exemptions from vaccinations. Can you imagine a time when they would just come up to you and just jam a needle in your arm and inject you with whatever they please? Do you trust the government to just say, hey, I want to, you know, I'm not saying I'm against all vaccinations or something. I'm just saying in general, do you want to give the government the right to inject you with a needle with whatever they so determine? No, thank you. I mean, the, the ramping up toward the end times is, is really obvious. And these are, these are the schemes of the devil. These are the disarming of the people, the removing of your rights. And you've got to be, you gotta be knowledgeable of them in order to prepare yourself, your family, and to win the spiritual war. All right, so 1 John chapter 2, I'm going to read verse 15 and 16. This will serve as the base for our study here today. The Bible says, Love not the world, Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, and here we go, these are the three keys. The lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And so what I want to look at is these three things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These, I believe, and the Bible clearly teaches it, are three ways that Satan will tempt you and try to cause you either to destroy, destroy yourself or he'll try to get you know, someone else to come against you in light of these three temptations and three ways that Satan will come at you. So you say, well, how is this invisible demon 
and his demons, how are they going to attack me? You know, some people have these horrible dreams. Like there's a guy, uh, I remember when I spent the night with one of my friends when I was little, it would be real dark. And uh, I'd look over and there was a little, those little red lights on a heater. And I'd be scared. You know, I remember thinking, you know, is that a demon or something? Like, what is that? You know, those little red lights, little eyes looking at me, right? And so a lot of people think when a demon attacks me, it's going to be scary looking. It's going to be like on these scary movies, walking on all fours, you know, backward, you know, crawling on the floor, running around on the ceiling or something like that. Is that how demons attack? No. They attack you with a, with a subtle whisper, with a nod, a, a nudge in, in one direction, with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Uh, Satan and the demons will use your natural weaknesses as a fallen sinner. That's what I believe the lust of the flesh is. Common sins and sinful desires. These are things that are common unto man. This is something that each and every one of us will struggle with. Whether it's lust after the opposite sex, or whether it's desiring money and covetousness and things like that. The lust of the flesh is just your sinful nature. Is it the fleshly body that you have right now? And even, even as born-again Christians, you're still in the flesh, the fleshly body like that, until, until you get a new body. And so you're at war. The spirit wars with the flesh until you're raptured or, or until we die and we're you know, brought to new life at the time of the rapture. The second one is the lust of the eyes. This is, this is kind of going with the first one, but it's a more pinpointed one. And this is covetousness is what it is. This is when people look at something that is not theirs and they say, I want that. And so this is one that a lot of people don't, um, especially our day. I mean, for goodness sakes, nobody even understands that adultery is, is that wrong anymore, let alone covetousness. Covetousness, in my opinion, is one of the chief sins and leads to almost every other sin, if you think about it. Uh, covetousness is, is really at its heart a denial of thankfulness for what God has given you. How much have I been blessed? I, I, I thank God just about every day for how much I'm blessed with. And now with that same mouth that offers up praises and thanks to God, I can also think about times where I, you know, oh, I wish I had this and oh, I wish I had that. You know, if you have health, you have a lot. If, if you have a, a Bible believing church, you have a lot. If you are saved, you have it all. And to think about how many times we in our hearts will become covetousness, uh, covetous toward these things. And I'll go ahead and tell you, the media and movies and people on the radio, it don't matter where you're at, they know how to play to this sin that's in you. They know how to play to your natural sinful, sinful desire here. They know how to appeal to your eyes, whether it's on a billboard or a movie you know, is it just so happened that, you know, every guy in a movie is as muscular and their shirt off, you know, every, you don't ever see a fat superhero, do you? It ain't going to happen, right? Or with women, does it just so happen every woman in a movie is just two pounds of makeup on them and they're scantily clothed, you know? The, the devil knows how to appeal to your carnal, uh, you know, reasoning, your lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes. And it's how he pulls believers into sins. The same thing happens with, with really a lot of other things, but that's the easiest way to illustrate that. Now, the last one, this, this one's a lot, it's really particular, and everybody might not struggle with this, but in different ways, I believe it affects different people. This one is the pride of life. This one appeals to your ego, uh, to a man's ego especially, or to women. You say, well, how could this appeal to women? And this is so obvious to me, it ain't funny, but the, the desire for a woman to dominate a man is very prevalent in our day. It's called feminism, and there's nothing, I believe, more prevalent in our society. Uh, but it, the same thing, the same temptation befalls men. If anybody's ever worked a secular job, they know that men are w ready and willing to backstab you if they think they can get it, get it, you know anything on you. Uh, I've, I've worked with them before, and probably work with them now. You know, people that will just throw you under the bus if they think that it gets them ahead at all. They will lie to you. They'll deceive you. They'll, they'll look for things that you might say or do that they can use against you. And all these things really fall back on pride of life. They want to be in charge. They want more money. They want to be liked by the boss. They want to be highly esteemed among men. And like I said, again, for women, it's really the same thing. The temptation is there. Well, you know, I know God said the man should lead in this or the man should lead in that. But, you know, maybe I should be in charge of this because I'm smarter about that or I'm smarter about that. It's a system that God set up. 
And so our, our sinful nature is naturally going to want to make us buck against those things. And there's a really good example of this. Now, turn with me to Matthew 4. If you remember last week, I went to Matthew 2 uh, to, to talk about how Satan tried to get Jesus to willfully, you know, accept his twisting of the word of God. He said, hey, I'm going to quote you a psalm. I think it was Psalm 91, if I remember off the top of my head right. I'm going to quote you a part of a psalm, Jesus. And when I quote you this psalm, it's going to prove to you that if you just jump off this tower here, then, you know, angels will catch you. He won't let you even hit the ground. It's just, it's like a prosperity twist. You know, it's, a, it's like, Joe, you see where Joe Osteen got it from, right here from the devil. It's very satanic. Now, here in Matthew 4, believe it or not, you can actually see two of these three things we just now looked at in 1 John. And so this is why I'm showing you, this is a common tactic of the devil. If you don't think he will tempt you this way, you're nuts and you're wrong. And if you don't think he has tempted you this way, you're wrong. Now, you also got to know that in your sin nature, it does not take the devil to make you sin. You have a sin nature. You're inclined to sin. You, these things will naturally tempt you. But the devil will come alongside and use that sin nature. And, try, and then he'll pro try to provoke you to specific sin. And you say, well, when would he do that? How do I know the difference? Well, number one, you ain't going to know the difference. It's hard to know the difference. Number two... If, if you were to try, it's more than likely when you're doing something for the Lord. When you're trying to get in church consistently, when you're trying to read and pray consistently, when you're trying to get people saved, those are the times when Satan's going to come at you and try to stifle your growth, try to stifle your consistency, and try to put you back down. I've experienced it. I guarantee you have too. If you look back in your life, you'll see times of peaks and valleys. And these are times when Satan will come in and he's, he's not there with red horns and glowing red eyes. He's there with a, something just to water you down, something just to cool you off a little bit. So let's look here real quick. Matthew 4, look at verses 1 to 3. The Bible says, Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Now, that's a very interesting thing there to think about. And you have to ask yourself, you know, what is going on here? Well, I'll give you my idea of what's going on here. I believe what he's trying to do is he's trying to tempt Jesus and appeal to what he perceives as a normal man. Now, Isaiah 53 tells us that Jesus wasn't walking around with a glowing aura around him, and you just could look at him and say, oh, that's God in the flesh. Now, when he went on the Mount of Transfiguration... It's almost like he just, boom, unzipped, and you could tell this is the Son of God, right? He, he just glowed, it was radiant, it was obvious. But most of the time, that was kind of veiled uh, in the flesh. He would just look like a normal man. But, so the devil comes up here, and you got to remember now, Jesus had not had a body up until this point. He was spirit, second person of the Trinity. And he had took on flesh at this point. And so he's coming up to Jesus, and let's just assume there's a chance that he already knew, and there's a chance he didn't know. We, it, the Bible doesn't tell us. I'm just going to assume, uh, for you know, just honesty's sake, that the devil didn't know. Is this God in the flesh, or is this just a man? And so what's he going to do with this regular man? You know, he's going to appeal to what he believes is a sin nature in that man. And now, obviously, Jesus was without sin. He didn't have a sin nature, but the devil might not know that. And so what he tries to do is he tries to come at Jesus and appeal to the pride of life. And that's what I think is going on here when he says, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones be made bread. So he's telling Jesus, hey, if you are who you say you are, you can do this mighty miracle here. And so the natural temptation for a regular carnal man would be, I'm going to show them who I am. Look at me. I am the Son of God. Look, boom, here it is. And Jesus could have done that. But he's not just going to do miracles at Satan's command. He doesn't feel the need to, you know, show him who he is or, you know, you know, pridefully stand up for, for that. And so I think you could kind of see, and there's not really much more to add to that. I think you can kind of see there how Satan is just naturally first starting off with a man. Let's appeal to his ego. If you are who you say you are, do this. Trying to get a man to, you know, defend his own personal pride. And obviously Jesus doesn't go for it. Skip down just a little bit, look at verse 8. This is right after, we remember last week, like I said, we looked at Satan twisting the word of God. 
In verse 8 it says, And again the devil taketh him up an exceeding high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and, and him only shalt thou serve. And so this right here is an attempt to the pride of man. And, and this shows us, too, a few things about the devil. Now, the devil can offer, offer you things. Uh, this is very clear. I mean, for one, he teleported. That, that shows miraculous power that Satan apparently has. Some people say, well, this is just a vision. That's not what it says. I mean, it, it very, I mean if it was a vision, it just put, it phrased it in a weird way because it said the devil taketh him up. Now, obviously, he could take him up in a vision. But I don't see any real good reason why not just to say that they teleported or they, they went there. And it definitely seems as if Jesus can teleport uh, and, and go from one place to another. And we know that angels are spiritual beings, so surely the devil uh, has, has some kind of ability to get somewhere fast and to go there. It seems like he had the ability to do that. So we can learn that. And then secondly, we learn more importantly, because the first one's just interesting, this one is more important to us is that the devil has some level of power over the kingdoms of this world to where he can give them to whoever he wants to. And you say, you know, have you ever asked yourself this question? Why does it seem like everybody who has any big corporation these days is wicked as hell? Why is it, you know, line them up. Mark Zuckerberg with Facebook, uh, Jack with Twitter, you know, all these CEOs, YouTube, and just line them all up. They're all liberal. They're all trying to censor conservatives and Christians. Why is that? Because Satan has given them that power. Satan has he's picked his man. He's convinced them. You don't know what kind of deals they've made. I've seen some of the weirdest videos of these rituals and demonic worship. You don't know what's going on behind closed doors. Some of these people have literally sold their souls for the power that they have today. And you say, well, where would you get that in the Bible? Right here. Satan tries to convince the Son of God to literally sell his soul, and he'll give him a kingdom. You better believe that the same thing has happened today. And so the same thing happens with men in our time, with men in the past. And it shows you that the devil will attack you by appealing to the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, your covetousness. I want money. I want riches. This reminds me the other day, just off the top of my head, I don't know why I'm going to mention it, but I might as well. This was kind of funny, and at the same time, it kind of aggravated me. I was in the gas station the other day, and, you know, this rough-looking fella comes in there. He didn't look too, too, too rich. Let's put it that way. He wasn't well-clothed. He kind of smelled funny walking in the door. I mean, you, I'm just being honest. I go down there, and I'm getting me a coffee. And guy comes in. He looks really rough, and he kind of staggers or kind of waddles side to side up to the counter there. And, he, and the, they were up there, and it was like a shift change or something. And the lottery, by the way, I don't know if you noticed this. I, you know, I don't tend to play the lottery. But, you know, the more you play the lottery, the more people would know. It ain't always functioning. They got to take it down for shift change and do this. Kind of, and so, the, you know, I'm in there frequently. I know the employees. They weren't doing nothing on purpose. It was just down. They were doing their job, right? So here waddles this in, this low life. And he comes up to the counter, and he's like, I want a lottery number, you know, 10 or something like that. And they're like, oh, I'm sorry, you know, it's down right now. Give us, if you give us a few minutes, it'll be up. And he proceeds to cuss and throw a tantrum and then waddles back out the door. And here I am getting my coffee, just kind of looking at him. And he looks, he looks at me he's like, I guess they don't want my business. And I just looked at him like he was an idiot because he was being an idiot. But I mean, you say, well, what does this have to do with anything you're saying? This guy was very clearly not rich, very poor. Did you know some of the most covetous, Money-hungry people are the poorest people amongst us. You know, the, they've said before the lottery is a tax on the poor, and I believe it. You know, and here's this poor guy. He wants money. He covets money. Give me money. Give me money. And you see he's in here cussing and acting like a fool and treating people mad because he's wanting to come in here and somehow hit it rich on the lottery that day. You know, I just want to make me a free million here real quick. And he sees these women as, you know, he's, they're stifling my progress to get money. And so I want to show you the, the way that covetousness works, the way that pride and desire and other things work, it, it comes out in many ways. And you can see it in people around you literally every day. And it looks ugly. There's very few things that are uglier than a person who is just off the, off the you know, just flying off on people being really mean for no reason. 
And they say, you know, the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. And it's it's very evident when you when you walk around just live your everyday life that that Satan has really really gotten to some people and, and turned them into some some mean characters. All right, just for sake of time here, I'm, I'm I don't, I don't want to go through the whole story. Uh, some of you guys I'm sure probably know this. If you want to turn turn to First Chronicles with me, this is near the beginning of your Bible, Michael. If you want to go ahead and turn there, First Chronicles. And while we go there, I'll just mention by in, you know in passing because, like I said, it, there's no use in me going through every one of these. And part of, part of what I want to do here now is just give you a little bit more biblical uh, example, a little bit more biblical illustrations to show you this is how Satan attacks. This is how Satan functions. There's not re anything really deep. I can't bring out anything new than what I've already said. I can just show you places in Scripture where the devil has done this and used this on people to try to destroy them. So in 1 Chronicles 21, that's where I'm going to go next. But just really briefly, if you had to think of a place in the Bible where a man of God was tempted by the lust of his eyes, where would you think? Well, what's the first story that pops in your mind when I say that? Well, the first one in my mind would be David and Bathsheba. And this is something that I've been reading through. That's actually where I'm reading through in the Bible right now. Uh, you know, David should have been at war at this time. There's so many things you can teach in this story. It's not even funny. Up until this point in the story, David's at war. David's fighting. David's on the run. David's busy. David's, you know, engaging in battle. He's right there with his troops. And then you come to a point in, in 2 Samuel where David, at all of a sudden, he's seen just at home. He's not out. He's there, you know, in his castle. He's there in his own, his own house. And he's just kind of idle. And instead of fighting the war like he's supposed to be, he is sitting on the sideline. And lo and behold, Satan uses that opportunity with, with, with David. And guess who's on the, on the top of her house bathing? Bathsheba. And it says that she's pretty. And David looks at Bathsheba. And, you know, there you go. One thing led to another. And before you know it, he's committing adultery with, I think it's Uriah is his name's uh, wife. And so what happens is, and like I said, I'm just going to have to paraphrase the story here for you so I don't have to read the full chapter, uh, or more than one chapter for that matter. But uh, what happens here is, he brings Uriah in, and he says, all right, you know, you can go on down to your house, have fun with your wife, because Bathsheba got pregnant. And what David's idea seemingly was, was if I can get her husband to go home, and they have marital relations, then... They're just going to think it's his kid, no, no harm, no foul. I can go on about my life. Well, he don't want to do that. And it shows you how Uriah was an upstanding man. He was a Hittite, I believe. But he was an upstanding man. He didn't want to go, while his men were in battle and fighting a war, he didn't want to go take it easy and spend time with his wife. The other people in battle, they couldn't go home and be with their wives. So why was he going to do such a thing? And it just shines light on how wicked what David, uh, David did was. You know, here's David. All his men are out in battle. They're fighting the war. And he's at home committing adultery with one of their wives. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty low. But how did Satan get David to that point? The lust of the eyes. And so this shows us you need to guard your eyes, especially men. This is probably more of a thing for men than women. But men need to guard their eyes. Even young men need to guard their eyes. When you see women out in public... And they're scantily clothed, and it, you can you can see every every little bit of their body. It's good to look the other way. You don't know what plan Satan has with with that woman. You don't know she could be possessed with twenty devils, and Satan may use that woman to try to come get you and destroy your testimony. And same thing for men, for that matter. But you better believe Satan has his people. And it doesn't seem like Bathsheba was all that bad of a person at the time either. But you got to know also, she, it didn't seem like she fought against committing adultery either. But that's just a quick, quick illustration and one quick biblical example of how Satan will use the lust of your eyes. And by the way, that's covetousness. He coveted some, another man's wife and, and fell by that sin. That's a sin that people struggle with today and, and, and fail at. I, I wouldn't even say they struggle with it anymore. They just willfully commit it. There's no fight. Look with me in 1 Chronicles now in 21. This is probably the number two example I think I can give you. And again, it's going to be with David. 
we find David here, and this is this is directly an attack by Satan. Look in verse one of First Chronicles twenty one. The Bible says, And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. And David said to Joab, to the rulers of the people and, and to the rulers of the people, Go number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan, and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. Look what Joab says in verse 3. And Joab answered, The Lord make his people an hundred times so many more as they be. But my Lord the king, are they not all thy, my Lord's servants? Why then doth my Lord require this thing? Why will he be a cause of trespass to Israel? And it says, nevertheless, David makes him go do it. And a, a lot of people be like, why is this a sin? Why is this some big deal? What's going on here? To me, I've never really struggled with that. But apparently, a lot of Bible commentators and people just really struggle with this. And, a, and another thing, just as an aside for people who study the Bible on a, on a deeper level, you'll notice there's a parallel here in 2 Samuel 24, verse 1. And in that one, it says that God literally, uh, well, I can just go there. I'll read it to you. Look at uh, 2 Samuel if you want to. I'll just turn there myself. It's just a little bit, you know, two or three books back to the left. Let me read this verse here to you. 2 Samuel 24, verse 1. Listen to this. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he moved David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. So in 2 Samuel, it says, The Lord's angry at Israel. And he moves David to do this thing. Now, and so some people say, oh, is God making him sin? No, he's not. This is just one way that the biblical writers and that people would refer to God's allowing something to happen and they attribute it as if God did it. And in other words, you ever heard this thing, the hedge of protection? I mention it a lot sometimes in my prayers. And some people say, you shouldn't pray for a hedge of protection. You're being like a Pentecostal. Uh, the Bible mentions there's a hedge of protection, and I would like to have it. <laughs> would you not like to have that hedge? I would like to have it. Now, I'm not going to be naming and claiming it like a Pentecostal. I'm not going to get nutty about it, but I'd like to be protected of the Lord, right? Well, here's, here's this, all it's saying is this. God is mad at Israel, and he opens up the floodgates. And in that way, you know, yeah, God did do that. But he didn't directly tempt anybody. The Bible says God does not tempt any man to sin. God doesn't do that. And so Satan does it. Satan does it by God's allowing it to happen. And you say, well, what did he do? He, he let Satan go to David and tempt David to take a census account of the armies of Israel. You say, well, what's wrong with that? How is that a sin? What's the big problem with that? I think it's as simple as this. David... All the battles, I mean, my goodness, read through the stories. It's, it's awesome stories. It's good reading. I found myself just reading extra than what I planned to every time that I was reading through uh, First and Second Samuel here recently because the stories are just interesting. You don't want to put it down. It's good reading. And God delivered David through so many things. He gave him the victory. And David had many, many mighty men on his side. A lot of people have essentially defected from Saul and was following David and helping, helping David. All the while, God was there with David protecting him, right? Who was David, David relying on? The Lord. And now here we get, you know, David set up. He has the kingdom in hand. He, everything's going his way. And what does he want to do? He wants to begin to rely on himself. And he, I believe this is a point where uh, the, the devil tempts David to get a little bit prideful. And he says, look what all you have, David. Look at all these armies. You should trust in them. And let everybody know how many men of war you have. Let everybody know how many chariots you have. You know, count your tanks. Count your cruise missiles. Count your nukes. Ain't that what the countries of the world do today? They count their nuclear warheads. All it takes is one, my goodness. But, you know, they stockpile hundreds and you know thousands of these nukes. And all it takes is one to wipe out probably a third of our country. And they got thousands of these things. And by the way, you say, well, how has one of them not went off yet? By the grace of God. God's restricting it. You know, go back to 2 Thessalonians 2, the restrainer. God is restraining certain things from happening. 
And I believe he's obviously restrained somebody from hitting that button to launch a nuke. So many innocent lives, you know, quote, innocent, because everybody sins. So many people would die, though. Babies. Think of how many babies would die. And one nuke was to hit a city. How many, how many young children would die? Certainly, they're, they're innocent. How many Christians in those cities would die? I mean, God is restraining such wicked things from happening. And you know what? Take this back to the biblical example. How many people in Israel were saved? How, how many people in Israel uh, had kids and had babies? Well, guess what? God was mad at Israel. And the time ran out. God is not eternally patient. He's patient, but not eternally. There will come a time for his wrath to come, be poured out. And how much more, even in the house of the Lord with Christians, he will chastise you. The Bible says if you're without chastisement, you're a bastard. Right. You don't have a daddy. That's a scary thing. How many people claim to be Christians and just live in sin? If you're in sin as a Christian, for one, you need to repent and get out of it. But let's just say you're in sin. If something bad don't happen to you, if you don't feel it, there's something wrong with you. You might need to be born again. But you say, well, when I sin, I just feel like garbage. When I sin, I just feel so miserable. When I sin, I just, it just reminds me I should be doing better. Well, good. Good. That's the level of chastisement. That means you have a heavenly father saying, you need to do better. I expect more, than, more, more of you. You're, you have a new spirit in you. You're born again. You're mine. You're a child of God. You're, you're someone who's going to judge angels. Get out of that. Yeah. You know, and, and it's, it's just amazing to me how many people claim to be Christians and the chastisement and the power of God is void in their life. Just totally, they're just void of it. So anyways, but in First Chronicles, long story short is David numbers his, his armies. He begins to rely a little bit more on himself and God don't like that. And I would just encourage you to read the rest of that. If you want to see the end, I'm not going to talk about it right now. I need to move on to the last point here, the last illustration. But if you want to see how that pans out, Eventually, David goes uh, to the threshing floor, offers a sacrifice, and the wrath ends right there. Um, it's a good story. I said, by the way, I don't know, Dad and Ashley was at Clear Creek when I preached down there. That is the text at the very end of uh, 2 Samuel, I believe it is. That's where I preached at from Clear Creek, where David says, I'm not going to offer anything to the Lord that didn't cost me nothing. He didn't want to take the threshing floor for free. He, had to, he wanted to pay for it. And you remember when I did that sermon down there where people, preachers, and men of God are offering in the Lord that which cost them nothing. It's like, oh, here's, a, here's John MacArthur's uh, Bible commentary. That's my sermon material for this week. Like God's going to be like, you're blessed. You know, like somebody's going to get something out of that. Uh, it's just amazing to me. I may not have a lot of time for sermon prep right now. But I guarantee you this, as this goes out on the internet, Lord willing, as you guys sit here in the pews, you know that God speaks to you through his word. But if I was to come up here and just read at you some commentary that some guy made, there's no power in that. There's no power in that. And there's, no, there's no reality of that. And there's definitely no reward for me in heaven. That's wood, hay, and stubble. You know? And these, these people are offering the Lord that which costs them nothing. And there's, there's a lot more to say about that, but that's another sermon. The last thing we'll look at here really quick. Again, just examples Showing you throughout the Bible, this is the wiles of the devil. This is how Satan attacks. This ain't some new teaching. This is the whole Bible's teaching. You say, well, how's he going to attack me? The lust of the flesh. Your normal sinful nature. The things that are common to man. There's some saying sin's not common to men, by the way. Like homosexuality and bestiality. That ain't common to men. You're not walking around just lusting after other guys as a man. That's not common. That's not the lust of the flesh. That's a perverse lust. That's a judgment of God, Romans 1 says. That's a blinded, darkened heart, Romans 1 says. That, that's not just a normal sin. The lust of the flesh is, hey, you know, if I told a little white lie here, it'd, it'd benefit me. Or the, the pride of life is, hey, I'd like to have that position. I deserve that. I could just backstab one person to get there. You know, or, or the... Uh, the lust of the eyes, you know, you, you look over at Bathsheba bathing on top of a building and you say, wow, that's good to the eye. I'd like to have that even though Uriah is her husband. Uh, look with me over in Numbers 25. This will be the last example. This is, this is a rather, this, this in here again, this illustration, this example 
is is a, one of the more difficult ones to understand. But when you get the whole Bible's teaching on it, it becomes very evident what's going on. Once you get to Numbers 25, if you want to put a finger in your Bible and go to the other one, you can. If not, I'll read it. Don't worry about it. The other one we'll look at is going to be Second Peter in chapter 2. I just, I just thought in my mind, you know, how many how many churches today have had service where people didn't even have to open their Bible? You know, that's just a thought that crossed my mind. It reminded me of when I went to Midwestern out in Kansas City. And I went through a whole semester there in person. And near the end of that semester, I, I asked myself, I said, you know what? I could have gotten through every class without ever opening my Bible. I literally could have. I'm not kidding you. At a Christian Southern Baptist, one of their main seminaries, I could have went through every one of those classes. Church history, Christian ethics, uh, theology, by the way, because he gave he went off of a, a PowerPoint. He didn't tell us to get in the Bible for these things. Uh, I mean, I could have went through all these classes and not even opened the Bible. How crazy is that? That's why I liked Clear Creek. At least Clear Creek had me going through the Bible, doing chapter summaries, doing doing the different things like that. How many churches, you know, have we even went to where they just they don't even make you study the Bible? That's something you know what I don't care if people find it boring or not. If we get a visitor come in here and they're like, "Wow, this is the most boring church I've ever been in," you're going to learn the Bible here, or you ain't going to have much of a reason to be here. I mean, I don't have much more to offer people. Do you, I mean, what else could I offer them? Should I prance around? You know, should I should I put on a show? That ain't what I'm about. I've never been about that. I'm, I'm here to teach this. This is what God gives people who preach. That's it. That you don't have anything else. And so that's what I have to offer. Look at this illustration and we'll close. Numbers 25. Just the first three verses. It says, And Israel abode in Shittim, and people began to commit whoredom with the daughters of Moab. And they called the people the they called the people unto the sacrifices of their gods. And the people did eat and bow down to their gods. And Israel joined himself unto Baal Peor. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. Now, I went to the end of a story, essentially. And the story of Balaam is a really interesting one. Uh, what I'll do again here is kind of summarize a little bit of it for you. Balaam was a prophet for hire. Balaam was a person who, it's one, remember how I've said before, in the Old Testament times, the Spirit of God would come on people and he'd depart from people. And so for whatever reason and however people want to try to explain it, Balaam is a unique case. Because, you know, people have different opinions. Is Balaam saved or is Balaam unsaved? Um, I actually would lean toward him not being saved because he is used as a wicked false prophet reference in the New Testament. It is kind of strange, though, how God did kind of speak to him and use him in some sense. So it's a unique situation, for, for sure. And so I understand some level of confusion on it. But the long story short with Balaam is this. God told him, don't go do it. And what, what happened is a man named Balak, I believe it was, sent for Balaam and said, I want you to curse Israel. Now, Israel's coming in. They're wiping people out. They're doing their thing. And this guy's like, oh, no, we're next. He's going to get us. What can I do to stop Israel, right? And, and so what he does is he says, I need to curse them. I need to get God to curse the people of God. Now, how do you do that? That's, that's hard to do, isn't it? How do you get God to write Ichabod on the, on the front door of a church? Well, I'm going to show you how. How do you kill a church? And how did, how did Satan try to, how to kill off Israel? Well, first he tried to go after a, a, a prophet and to hire him a false prophet, come in here and curse the people of Israel. Balaam couldn't do it. He said, I can't do it. It's impossible for me. And he was going and seemingly trying. And, and God would come upon him and say, no, it ain't going to happen. And he would prophesy blessings on Israel. You know, and it was, it's just hilarious to read. And this guy keeps on getting frustrated. He's like, I wanted you to curse them and you blessed them. What are you doing? And so the story in the Old Testament ends and you don't really get in. Bal Balaam goes home. You don't really hear anything else about it. I mean, it's kind of odd. But the New Testament writers kind of add a little bit to it. And they tell us a little bit more about it. I'm going to read to you a part here. Listen to what Second Peter says. In chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Says that these evil false prophets is what he's talking about here. Says, having eyes full of adultery 
and that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls, and heart that have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which, listen to this, have forsaken the right way and are gone astray following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumb ass being a donkey, speaking with man's voice forbade the badness of the prophet. And the New Testament elsewhere, I mean, it goes on to tell us that what he did is he taught, he taught the children of God to commit fornication. And what he did, now here's how it goes. When you take the full biblical witness of what happened here. Balaam loves money. Balaam wanted money. He was a prophet for hire. And so he wanted to try to figure out some way to get that money from Balak and, the, and for Balak to succeed. And he couldn't do it by cursing them because you can't curse the children of God. The people of God, they're on their way to heaven. You can't curse them. You can't make God just go against the child of God. But what he could do was he could show and said, hey, here's what you do, Balak. You get the children of Israel to commit filthy abominations, to, to marry unto whores and to lay with whores and, and to commit uh, fornication with them. And then God himself will curse them. God himself will judge them. Right? And so he gets the people of God to do wicked things, which brings chastisement from God upon the people. And God, and, and you read the story there, God does do it. He, he kills thousands of them. And that is how Satan got his way and moved in there and did that. Now, you say, well, what does that have to do with the sermon of the schemes, the wiles of the devil, Satan's devices? Well, what does it go back to again? The children of Israel... The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. They were lusting after these women. And so what Satan says through Balaam, his false prophet, who he, who he hired with, with uh, you know, unrighteous mammon. He says, hey, Balaam, there's one way you can get them to do it. And so Satan nudges Balaam to teach this man, teach Israel to commit fornication, teach Israel to commit sin, and then God will judge them. And so he appeals to their eyes, right? A man looking on a woman to lust. A man looking at, or a woman looking on a man less because it worked both ways. And one interesting part in that story, by the way, if you if you go through and you study that, is the way that the God's wrath is stayed in that is a man of God. Um, I forget what his name was. Starts with a J, I think. But one of the men of God is a priest, I believe. He uh, he stood up, and one of the men they was just they was just frolicking around the tents or whatnot, and here comes an Israelite with some, uh, some like other uh, pagan woman, and they go in the tent and start doing filthy things. And the man of God, it's just right flagrantly in front of everybody, right? And the man of God gets a, gets a spear, runs in there, boom, spears through one, one of them's back, right through the other one's stomach, kills them both. Yeah. And you say, well, that's mean. That was murder. No, it wasn't. God said, good job, and the wrath of God was stayed. So let, let some of these liberal Christians of these days read that story. Let's let them, let them choke that down and try to figure out how to explain that away. God is not, you know, some little tame little kitty cat. He's a roaring lion. And, and God is not someone to mess around with. He, he, for, for the shedding of innocent blood and for filthy abominations, God's wrath will come upon people. And the, the, the false church and the false Christians today want to try to pretend like that never happens. But that's just a few examples I want to give. And you could probably come up with more. You know, if you read the Bible yourself, you can come with story after story where you got the people of God being tempted by lust of their flesh. You got David being tempted to commit adultery. You can just go through and time after time again, Satan will use your sinful nature to try to, to, try to get God to chastise you. Or he'll use your sinful nature to destroy your testimony. And just to, just to close and give you kind of a, a point of application here, it's something I think me and Jack specifically need to be aware of. We need to guard our testimonies. We need to guard our minds and hearts. Satan's going to attack us. Yeah. Satan's going to try to bring us down and, you know, oh, you know, this person ain't there. This person ain't doing it. Or, oh, you know, you should just quit and give up. That, these things, these are the attacks of Satan. And, you know, like I said, Lord willing, next week I'll show you some more, uh, which we've, we've already read through some of it, just to give you a hint at what it will be. But uh, Satan, he comes at the body of Christ. I'll put it to you that way. Next week, I believe that's what we'll be looking at. We'll be looking at how Satan really hits churches, uh, which I think is something we need to know. We need to be prepared of as we move forward. We start doing the hard work of God. 
Uh, evangelism is the work of the church. Uh, you got two things, I believe, that are primary and central. The teaching of the Word of God, the edification of believers, and evangelizing. If you don't have those two things, you're not doing your job as a church. And uh, when you go about to do that, Satan will attack. That's the reason I'm doing these sermons. That's the reason I'm going through these teachings. So what I would say is this. Pray for protection. This, this is your application. This is what we need to do as Christians, believers in here. Uh, you know, everybody in here basically saved it, I believe. We know Jesus Christ, our Savior. He died for our sins on the cross. He rose again on the third day. You know, if somebody listens to this online, the way of salvation, I'm going to preach on it tonight in, in a sense. It's just believe on Lord Jesus Christ. But it's under attack today. And if you want to know more about that, then you just come back this evening and we'll talk about that. But we as believers, we don't need to get saved or get re-saved or anything like that. Now, some of us may need to dedicate ourselves fresh to the Lord. I do believe in that. You say, well, well, how does that work? Well, sometimes you realize I'm not where I used to be or I'm not where I need to be. And this can happen for me, me and Jack. It doesn't matter who you are. You can be a Bible teacher, a preacher. You can be a pew sitter. You, anything you're doing in life, you drift in your mind, in your heart, in your actions. You drift. And that drift is Satan pulling trying to get, get you, like I said, off your game and away from what you need to do. We need to pray for a hedge of protection. You say, How, what does that look like? Well, what did Jesus tell us to pray? Lead me not into temptation. And so we need to pray. Put that hedge of protection around me, Lord. You know, Satan wants to attack us. Satan wants to keep us down. He wants to beat us down mentally. He wants to draw us into some kind of sin. You know, especially as a preacher, adultery disqualifies you instantly. You know, a man or one woman, a one woman man. You can't you can't be divorced. You can't you can't be someone who's you know committing adultery or anything like that. That's one of the primary ways you see many ministers fall. Uh, men, men and women in the church getting you involved in some scandal makes anybody in the community. I ain't going to go there. Those, I got some wicked people there, and so Satan attack you in the pew. He'll attack the people in the pulpit, and so you need to ask for that. Protect me, Lord. Lead me away from these temptations. And I think it's interesting, he says, lead me away from temptations. Because some people will say, lead me into those temptations, I'm strong. Well, I'll go ahead and tell you, the more I've studied the Bible, the more I realize I'm not strong. The more I realize I'm totally relying on God, the more I realize I can apply all this stuff, the more I realize I'm, I need the Lord on my side. I need the Lord to lead me out of temptation. Because I look, I read, and I say, David did it. David did it. Am I better than David? Solomon did it. Am I better than Solomon? The, the second wisest man to ever live, number one being Jesus? I'm, I'm better than Solomon? Absolutely not. If Solomon can fall, fall into false doctrine, I can, and I did. You've got to watch yourself. You've got to be on guard. The best men and women in all of Scripture failed. On their best day, they were a sinner. And you better believe 6,000 plus years, because the earth ain't billions of years old, 6,000 plus years, Satan knows how to come at you. He knows how to tempt you. He knows how to say, that's the lust of their flesh. That's their pet sin. This is the thing that gets them off their game. And he'll come at you and he'll, he'll throw his fiery darts at you. That's what the Bible refers to as fiery darts. He's just throwing his darts trying to hit you, you know. So we need to pray for that protection. Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you for a day here and to worship together. I ask God that you would protect us, not just as individual believers, but as a church. Uh, I pray, God, that you'd help build zeal in us and uh, encourage us and strengthen us for the mission ahead to see people saved. Yes. Uh, whether it's one uh, a month or one a year, I don't, it's up to you, God, to, to spread your word and to bless it and, and to grow the congregation and all that. Uh, I just want to be a faithful steward of the ministry and to try to teach your word and teach people the Bible, help them to understand it. And God, I thank you here for Jack. Uh, good Sunday school lessons, good teacher, a faithful man of God. There's not many people like him. And I uh, thank you for giving us a kindred spirit here where we both uh, enjoy your word. We come together on the same doctrines. I pray that you keep us in unity and you help the people that come. They sit in the pews and they sing with us and they listen to the Bible preached. I pray that you would instill in them a zeal for their family members that are lost for their friends and and for them to get if anything else just to start reading your word more and just to come to church and to, and to hear the word of god preached and taught uh, to, to draw closer to you because the day's approaching i believe that lord um, and I, I say come quickly 
uh, please send, send your son to, to gather his people and uh, bring bring judgment upon this world. I, I look forward to that. Uh, but, but alongside that, God, I look forward to trying to get people saved until that time. So um, it, I guess it's a blessed tension. I pray that you'd help us to live in that tension where we want you to return, but we want people saved. And um, God, all I can say is I thank you and praise you for being so good to me and my family and for to us as a people. We ask for protection. We ask for uh, leading away from temptation. And we ask God that you'd bless our services as we continue on as a, uh, a small flock here trying to honor you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.